Amen. In 1 Corinthians 13, what is often called the love chapter, it gives us this word, charity. If you look at the very last verse in the chapter, it tells us in verse number 13, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. There are many gifts that are listed in the Bible that should come from the Holy Spirit as you begin to grow. And he's trying to tell us that the number one gift is charity. If you want to be successful as a Christian, it's charity. He tells us that even some of these other gifts may pass away, but the ones that should remain that are timeless are faith, hope, and charity. And I want to talk today about what is the difference between charity and love. And this is very important. It's very timely in America. As if you remember, this was written to the church at Corinth, which they had a problem with the things that they loved, and it wasn't pure in God's eyes. They had a charity problem in the church, and they didn't understand the difference between love and charity. The single greatest thing you can do as a Christian is to demonstrate charity. That's what we're called to be known by. Uh, now, it's really a, a true, it's a pure, it's a power. Charity is true, pure power. When you are exercising charity in your life, it can without a doubt be said that it's the Holy Spirit working through you. Oftentimes we say we love something, but we just don't mean it the same way. Even today, if you look at a dictionary from uh, 200 years ago, the, the definition at the bottom is a charitable organization. Today you look at it, it at the top is a charitable organization. So it's kind of the word has kind of fallen out of use. You could call it archaic in a sense, but the application is still true and righteous and complete today. We're not talking about a nonprofit organization. We're not talking about feeding the hungry either. True charity uh, is pure. It's pure love. Charity as we see it is biblical love. To love as Christ loves. Charity is the act of demonstrating selflessness and preferring others better than yourself. In a sense, you could say it's showing your heart. You can tell me what you love, but if I watch you long enough, I'll know what you really love. Now, we're not just talking about covetous, lust, or fleshly love. Charity is in a different category. Charity is something that uh, should be pure, godly love. Again, this is called the love chapter but it doesn't use the word love, why not? If we were to go back to the Greek, which we won't, we would find out it's the word agape. And I've heard sermons in different churches my whole life where they try to make a big distinction out of it, and I, frankly, I think that's confusing. I have enough confidence in the English language, in the King James Bible, we're not missing anything, we're going to define it by the Bible. A fact about that is uh, that word Agape is used 80 sometimes as love, and then 20 sometimes as charity. So the word charity obviously has the definition love inside of it. The word charity clearly means love, but there's something special about that word charity in the application and the verses that use it, especially in this chapter. I don't think we really know what the word love is these days. I think we're easily confused what love is. I tell you, my dog, he loves sausages. My baby loves milk. Brother Ross loves coffee. I'm picking on you twice this week. I owe you one. Okay, I'll, send, I'll get you a gift card for coffee. Okay, <laughs> that's three. All right, three strikes. <laughs> I love a juicy steak. Boy, I love some chocolate. I tell you what, right? Or today, if you have any co-workers, I, I love this TV show. Did you see this guy said that, and they did this, and they're going that, and it's like, you're talking about nothing. What do we really love? The Corinthian church, I remind you, they were very confused about love. 
They had open fornication in the church and they were loving about it. They didn't kick them out. God said, no, 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 you're puffed up about this and rather you should be mourning about what's going on in the church and you need to have uh, the right kind of love. Many churches today, I, I had somebody sitting out here in the parking lot one day, oh, I, I go to this such and such church, it's the big mega church down the road. I just think we, they should love everybody. Hitler? Stalin? I mean, John Wayne Gacy? I mean, we can go through a list and people will say, we love everyone, Hitler? Well, well no, I mean, I mean, he's the one exception. You can keep going, right? We've talked about the difference in contrasting love and hate. I want to talk about charity because the Corinthian church, in their culture, they practiced and allowed these gross public displays of perverse sensuality for a religious sake, for a religious purpose. They had temple prostitution. It was perverted. The devil was using the flesh uh, that God, and God's creation uh, to kind of spit in God's face and kind of go against His intention for the body. They were going against the Creator for pleasure. That's selfishness. That's not biblical love. That's not pure love. That's not godly love. Charity, on the other hand, is loving as Christ loved you. And i got to tell you, there's some unlovable people in here. Amen? Probably all of us at moments. You know, being truly charitable is to be, show charity to the uncharitable. And this is a problem today because we have people that want to abuse our love, take advantage of us. Uh, we were sitting at lunch and I received a phone call before I could get to it. It went to voicemail. It was a call for the church. And the lady says, I was calling to see if I could get a Thanksgiving and a Christmas basket. And let me give you my address. Here's where you can drop it off. Well, <laughs> uh, do I know you? Have you ever been to church? I mean, my, my, I think you're abusing charity in that sense. Now, if Christ were here, he being God is greater than I, I can give you five biblical reasons why I shouldn't give that person anything. Christ is greater than us. I really believe that true joy and success comes when we give in to this sort of charitable love. We let go of our own goals and ambitions and we start helping others. Charity, here's a textbook definition. Charity, the voluntary giving of help to those in need. That's a dictionary from today. This isn't like from 200 years ago. Voluntarily, so you're going out of your way, you don't have to. Giving of help to those in need. Now, in the church, this was written to the church, and he's trying to compel us to love each other. And I'm just going to lay it all out. Look, we stop our spiritual growth because we don't love the people in the church with us. Plain and simple. We hold a grudge. Uh, where's brother so-and-so? He didn't make it today. Uh, I don't know. We might see him next week. Then you forget about him next week. Then three weeks goes by, and you know what? He's sitting at home saying, man, I can't believe none of those people called me. Or worse than that, you sit across the pew from each other, and you always hold that grudge from ten years ago. There was that thing that you didn't like them for. If you would, go to John 13. Charity really begins at home. Charity begins in the church family. The first responsibility is to take care of the needs of your own, of your family, of your friends, of your church. And I tell you, the simplest definition, I think, of charity is pure love as Christ. That's charity. But demonstrating the love, doing something with the love, not just saying, I love you from a distance. In Romans 5, 8, it says, But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, Brother Donald, I love you even when you're mean to me. Boy, that's the love of Christ. That's charity, isn't it? Now, that doesn't come in the flesh. It doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come easy. Hey, this is an easy doctrine to understand. If you're going to take notes tonight, this is not going very deep. It'll be easy to understand even when you read it a year from now. 
but it's very difficult to put it into actual practice. To love as Christ. Pure love as Christ. Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Well, it doesn't take much to separate us from each other's love, does it? Can you believe what that guy did to me? Or didn't do for me? Just that quick. We get upset, we hold a grudge, we get mad at somebody, our feathers get ruffled. Ephesians 5, 2. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. He says, walk in love as Christ loved us. When the Lord Jesus Christ walked through the earth and He walked through the people, He loved them. It says He had compassion on them. He had pity on them. He cared for them. He really, really cared in a way that I don't think we're even capable of. But He's given us of the Holy Spirit. And He says that as my Father sent me, so send I you. And so now I have the power of loving through the Holy Spirit, pure godly love, demonstrating this charity, which is beyond my capability. It's beyond my physical uh, uh, reputation. I mean, this is good godly love that can only come from above. I, I, went, to, I went to Costco this week and there's this lady sitting there, and I see her all the time. She's sitting there. She's one of the ones that gives out servings, you know, samples. And she was sitting there, and she was doing like this. And there wasn't any food. You know, she's just waiting on food. I walked up to her, and I smiled at her, and I said, Are you bored, lonely, or praying? And she laughed. And she said, all three. <laughs> and I said, well, what are you praying about? I'll pray with you. She kind of looked at me. Like, and she knows me. Usually she sees me with the family, you know. And we talked for a moment. And then she began to pour out her heart. And she really began to pour out her heart. She's got something going on in her life. And there's strife. And there's some issues. And I prayed for her. And I continued to pray for her. It was interesting. The next day, I had to go back to Costco. I had to take somebody from work to help them get a printer they had on sale. And I'm there with this guy. And we're walking by, and there she is. And it was neat to see her again, this time with a smile. Oh, let me back up. She said, before I prayed with her, she said, are you a preacher? <laughs> I said, well, yes, ma'am. I thought you were. I could tell. You like to help people, don't you? Well, yes, ma'am, I do. That's not me. That's not the old Adam Fannin. That's that new man as I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and I see somebody hurting and they need love, charity, and a love on them. I pray for them. Well, the next day I'm there with another guy and it was interesting that there were three people in that store that had testimonies that I talked to and he's just like, do you know everybody around here? Like, they go to your church too? And Well, they've been, but they haven't, you know, haven't seen them in a while. And, and I see her and she was just like, you were a godsend. You have no idea how encouraging was, that was for me. Thank you. I'm praying for you. And the guy I'm with, he's just like, Wow cool. I don't say it to boast. I just say it like, guys, you never know when you cross a path with somebody and they need encouraged and they need some love. And I'm thankful that we have some very kind and loving people in our church. Sister Peggy Sue says, it's going to be gray and cloudy all week, so we have to be the sunshine. That's what she told me before church. Amen. That's good. That'll preach, right? Uh, Brother Donald, every time you see him at the flea market, Jesus! Like, he's like, whoa! <laughs> it's like, amen, that's cool. Sister Sylvia, telling people that you love them and you care for them and that we're a blessing. That's awesome. Sister Sandy, I remember when you were praying with Sister Angela when she needed some help, and you poured out your heart, and you cared for her, and you loved on her when she was having a rough day. I could go on, and I'm very thankful for the loving church family that we have here, but you never know when you just plant a little bit of a seed of selflessness and you show some charity to somebody where you don't know where they're going off track and then you get their attention. The lady at Costco, as I began the conversation with her, one of the things I asked her was, is God with you? It's kind of a trick question. There is no other religion that has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, 
right? We can pick on the religions as we have been. And Brother Ross tells me I need to get the, the perverts of Islam a little bit more. He says, don't leave them out now. <laughs> yes, sir. Amen. They're coming, right? Uh, but really, you know, how do we minister? We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. They can't overcome evil with good. We can. We have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. And we get to pour out some love unselfishly to somebody and give them that gift that Christ has given to us. We should have this pure love as Christ. We ought to, here's the thing, guys, we should treat our spiritual family in this church better than we treat our physical family at home or your extended family. Ooh, I've heard the way some folks talk to their family. You'd think they were enemies. Now, I don't think we have that problem here. But nonetheless, once you get used to somebody, you kind of give them the cold shoulder here and there. You kind of ignore them. Well, in church, it ought not to be that way. If you want to be refreshed and loved, then just love somebody else. Demonstrate pure, godly love. Charity. In 1 Timothy 5, stay in John 13. We're about to get started there. But in 1 Timothy 5, listen to this. He says, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. He says, and the younger men as brethren. Okay, so um, I'm going to pick on a couple guys that are older than me. That's mostly everybody past Brother Morgan. So well, Brother Donald and Brother Paul. Now, if he says something wrong, oh, Brother Larry. Brother Larry's like, he forgot me. Okay. What he's saying is, if you have an older brother in Christ, you should not be rude and rebuke them. I need to tenderly entreat them. If, if you said something out of order or incorrect, Instead of me snapping at you, hey man, that ain't right. Let me tell you what's right. I would say, well, actually, brother, it's not quite like that. Let me let me show you what the Bible says, or let me give you my opinion. What he's saying is, we would gently entreat our elderly father if he were here, and that's how we ought to treat older brothers in Christ inside the church. He says, the younger as brethren, the younger as brethren, brother Titus is like my little brother, spiritually speak him. So I need to treat him with the same respect as I would if somebody was messing with my little brother, right? And he says the same thing with the ladies. He says the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. I mean, pure love in the church is godly love. And when an elderly lady speaks to me, I need to have the same respect that I have for my mother, and when a younger lady speaks to me, I have the same respect as if she's my sister or my daughter. Caring, loving, pure, godly love. That's charity. I really believe that God's greatest power is displayed in our lives when we allow Him to demonstrate selfless love through us. When we embrace charity. In John 13, let's take a look at this. John chapter 13, find verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, and that ye also love one another. Now, this is, loving is a new commandment, but loving as Christ loved, well, that, that's a whole other level. We're, aren't we quick to say, well, who is my neighbor, or who is my brother, or I only have to give them as much as they give me, right? But he's saying, no, no, I want you to love in the way that I love you. You've tasted of the love of Christ. You've felt it on yourself. Now you give that to somebody else. He says, love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. He says it a second time. I mean, <laughs> Jesus died for you, paid for all of your sins. Even when you're rebellious and obstinate, He's still compassionate with you and merciful. Do you share that kind of love with other Christians? Look at the next verse. This is important. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. That's the identifier. How do we identify a real Christian? Well, they have the love that Jesus had. He led us in love. He came in the form of a servant the first time. Look, he's coming back as a conquering king. He came as a gentle lamb and he was laid down to the slaughter. Oh, he'll come back as a roaring lion. But right now, in this time, he's given us of the Holy Spirit and he says, what I did, that you do. And you do greater works, you do more works, you show more love. We have our whole life to live for Christ. He only had three and a half years of ministry. You say, well, Pastor Fannin, I don't even know if i got three and a half years left. <laughs> you better use it. 
You say, I only got a week left. You better use it. I really believe that if you're alive, God has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you in the body of Christ to help build people and preach the gospel. What does the selfish, selfish selfless love of Christ look like? How has He loved you? Are you loving others the same way? Uh, go to John 15. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. And I know there's a fake church and a fake crowd that claims to be more loving than Jesus, and they go against the Bible, and that is the Corinthian church in one regard when he had to rebuke them and tell them to get the fornication out of the church. This is why I believe when you get to 1 Corinthians 13, after giving this list of gifts, he comes back to, listen, the greatest gift is charity. Not what you love or desire, but showing true, pure, godly love to other people is when God gets the most glory in your life. I mean, Jesus forgave His offenders. He forgave those that betrayed Him, and He did it for their sake. And we won't let something go because we're just so selfish. We'd rather dig up the past from 10 years ago yeah, but they said this back in the day. So what? You said some dumb stuff back in the day too. Do we, should we all bring that up and, you know, try to drag you through the mud? John 15, if you would, look at verse number 8. John 15, verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. So how can we glorify the Father? Well, bringing forth more spiritual fruit in our life. Well, what's the fruit that he wants to talk about right away? Well, he's talking about loving as Christ, just as we see in the book of Corinthians, verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Okay, so if I keep the commandments of Christ... I'm not going to offend you because I won't lie to you. I won't steal from you. I'm not going to covet your stuff. I'm not going to blaspheme against you. I'm not going to gossip against you. I mean, we could go down a list of commandments, and it's like, how is it that if I just obey what this says and how I treat you, I know for a fact I'm not going to sin because I did it His way, and I did it through His Spirit. You understand, it's, we're not hurting from someone else. We're honoring God in what we do. We're abiding, as it says, in His love. Now, is abiding in the love of Christ, does this come naturally or does this come spiritually? Abiding in the love of Christ, does this come naturally or does this come spiritually? If I don't get volunteers, I'm going to start calling names, okay? See who's awake, all right? <laughs> spiritually, of course. It's hard to continue abiding in love. We have to walk in the new man, the spiritual man, right? Look at verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy right, re might remain in you and that your joy might be full. I want you to know this, until you forgive others and really demonstrate charity on others, you're never going to be happy with yourself. The, the joy of God will never be successful in your life as long as you continue to hold a grudge, gossip against people, hurt people with your mouth. This is just what he's telling us. Abide in my love, and guess what? Your joy will be full. And boy, when your joy is full, you can care less about everything else. Verse 12, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you telling me i got to take a bullet for Brother Ross? He's shaking his head, yes. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> uh, hold on, let's start. That Brother Doug should take a bullet for Brother Ross? Let me volunteer somebody else over there. Now, we think of that in laying our life down, but you know what laying our life down for somebody else is? Brother Chad, come up here. Impromptu illustration, if you don't mind. Sure. All right, go that way. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, excuse me. You first, sir. Thank go ahead. You. Just letting someone else have the way. Caring about somebody else. Thank you. That, yeah. Have a seat. Thank you, sir. I just want to give you this thought that if you really love somebody, you're going to let them pass on by. If you don't and you only love yourself, it's like, get out of my way. i got to go. What I'm doing is most important, and you get out of my way. I'm numero uno. Right? Isn't that what we do? 
We try to get the preeminence above everyone else. And you know what we don't have when we do that? Joy. It feels good to help somebody else. It does. That's a fact. You say, Pastor Fannin, how do I do that? How do I have greater love to be able to lay down my life, lay down my preference for someone else? Look at verse 5. Take a step back. Look at verse 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. He says, without me, uh, ye cannot love selflessly. He says, without me, you cannot really have charity and love and joy. And that's the goal. Man, I want Christ to shine through me that when I touch somebody else's life, even if they don't know my name, they never come to church, I, you know, I just want to show them the love that God has, and I want to be able to say, hey, is God with you? Yeah, He is. Well, if He's with you, then what are you worried about? And encourage somebody that's downtrodden. And love on somebody that's feeling lonely and depressed and hurt and confused. God's given us great power through His Holy Spirit to just reach out and touch lives and help people. And I tell you, there is no greater joy than letting the love of Christ work through you. And when you walk away, they say, praise the Lord. Not Praise Adam Fannin. They say praise the Lord. That's success. That's the goal. Uh, if you would, go to John 21. When's the last time you laid down your plans to help someone else accomplish something? Let somebody cut you off in traffic. Now I'm preaching to the preacher. Uh-uh, buddy, you're not getting in front of me. I'm bigger than you. And I'm <laughs> I'll scoot over there. <laughs> When's the last time you let a coworker or a friend have the preference? I let uh, Sister Sylvia shared some chocolates with us, and what a treat it was. Uh, Naomi, she really wanted those white chocolates. And Daddy has a weakness for white chocolate. I, I let her pick the white chocolate because I love her. And then I took a bite afterwards, but anyway. <laughs> When's the last time you let somebody else uh, get first pick? When's the last time you let somebody else get the glory in a situation? When's the last time you really just went out of your way to thank somebody because of the work that they've put in? In 1 John 3, 18, listen to this. He says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. The truth of the matter is, uh, if you're not doing the deeds of love, which is called charity, then you're only loving in words. Isn't that what it talks about when a brother or sister is destitute and in need? What's it say? Oh, God bless you. Be filled. Be warmed. But you don't give them the things that their flesh needs? Well, that's not showing love. That's not being charitable. If you came up to me after service and you're like, Brother, I need a tank of gas. I'll be like, really? Let's pray. Well, I should probably say, here, take this card. Go. Right? Here's 20 bucks. God bless you. Give God the glory. Right? I'll pray for your situation. Now, think about it. Uh, he says, don't love in word, but love in deed. Indeed. Love in deed and in truth. L really let it be shown that you're doing the work for somebody else. Acts of love or actions of love. That's charity. Charity is pure motivation through compassion. Pure, godly love. That's what we're looking for. Uh, John 21, look at verse 15. John chapter 21, verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Now what were the these that he was talking about? Who knows? Do you might remember? The 153 fish that he had just caught. Right? 
Do you love me more than this? Hey, you left me to go back to that. Don't you remember when I called you out of that occupation into a discipleship and now I'm gone and what? You go back to fishing and you don't just go back, but you take others with you. Come on, guys. I got a deal on a boat and boy, we got a net and I know that old spot. Don't worry. We'll do it. I know exactly what it's going to take. Right? And finally, Jesus gives him the miracle. He gives him the food, meets him at the shore and he's like, do you love the worldly pleasure and riches more than me? Do you want 153 big fish? I'll give them to you. These are, hey, you know, those yellow tin fun, uh, yellow fin tuna, that's an expensive fish, isn't it? You guys know what I'm talking about? It's a big fish. Can you imagine 150 of those things? I mean, they get a serious price on those. Do you lo look what he says, uh, John 21, 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Now what are the lambs he's talking about? The disciples. The disciples that he took away from the shepherd. He said, What are you doing? You need to feed them spiritually, and don't worry, I'll keep some fish in your belly. Quit worrying about the fish, quit worrying about your belly, quit worrying about your pocket, quit worrying about gold. Don't love that stuff. You love my job I've given you of feeding people the Word of God and ministering to the hurting people. He said, you do that. You feed my lambs, then you're really showing me that you love me, that you love like me, and as I have loved you. Go back to 1 Corinthians 13. I just have to ask you, is there anything that you love more than Jesus? Is there anyone you love more than Jesus? Is there anything you won't give up for Jesus because you're just holding on to it because, well, I'm just, I'm comfortable in life where I'm at and I've got everything I need. Too many times we give up greater blessings for simple earthly things. Matthew 6, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If you're only after the riches instead of the righteousness, you'll never get the riches or the righteousness. You'll never have satisfaction or joy. When you focus on working for Christ as you've been called to, if God's calling you to ministry, then you go all in. You do everything that you need to do to be ready to answer that call and to minister to your neighbors and knock on doors and talk to strangers and people in your own house. What is charity? From us, it's to love God, isn't it? To put Him above everything else. It's to love His Word. It's to love His people. Love your family. Love the lost. And not just in word, but to show it, to do it, to see those deeds. It's to hate the sin in your life. It's to love Christ and honoring Him more than the sin that's in your life. And don't let your desire for anything get in the way. And... 2 Timothy 1, he says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. God's giving you the spirit of love. That's a description of God in you. That's love. How do you get an old friend back to church? Well, you love him back. You tell him you miss him and you love him. You tell them it's not the same. You show some love. You re-invite them. I remind you in 1 John 4, he said, we love him because he first loved us. When, he, when you understand what he did for you and how easy it is to be saved, man, isn't that just the good, I mean, that's good news. That's the best news. That feels good. And we love him because he first loved us. But then the warning was in Revelation, he says, you've lost your first love. You need to repent. You're not loving Christ anymore. You love the world. You've got distracted by the cares of the world. Your first love is Christ, and you've given up on it. You won't even show up. 1 Corinthians 13. Look at this real quick, and we'll be done in just a minute. I want you to see this. We'll look at each verse real quick. Verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or as a tinkling cymbal. Now, a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, that's racket. That's just something that's just making a noise, right? He says, it's important to understand, if, you're, if, I, if you don't have charity, then you're just being noisy, whatever you say, whatever you say. But I, I want to point out something about this statement because the Pentecostals love to use this and abuse this, and they try to claim, oh, I, have the, I speak in the tongue of angels. And you're like, oh, really? 
<laughs> because when I see in the Bible that the angels speak, they have some sort of a supernatural sonar power that's spiritual and they can destroy things with their words. And I don't see that happening with you, right? I don't see any fire on top of your head. I don't see you raising the dead, right? So the Pentecostals, they're liars. It's a lying spirit. It's a deceiving spirit, lying signs and wonders. But they'll grab a hold of this and say, well, see, Paul spoke with the tongue of angels. <laughs> well, actually, he's not saying that I do and you can. Paul is being facetious. Paul is giving us a contrast. Here's what I do, but what if I could even do that? Why? Because he's talking to the Corinthians that were so loving in their church, they just let the sin in and they didn't correct the problem. He told them about the gifts and then he says, now listen, charity is so important. What if I could speak like an angel? Well, you can't because you're a human. He's kind of answering a fool according to his folly. You guys know that proverb where he says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. He's trying to give you this uh, facetious or sarcastic statement to try to highlight that you say you're doing all these great works, but you don't have any love. You're pointless. I mean, hey, even if you could speak like an angel, but you didn't do it with love, well, what good is it? He does this in three or four statements in a row. He says something that's obtainable, and then he says something that's impossible. I want you to understand that as we look. Uh, verse 1, he says, tongues of men, tongues of angels. The angels is impossible. A man can't speak in that tongue. Verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy. Boy, now Paul had that, didn't he? Well, he had the gift of preaching, right? And understand all mysteries. Now, wait a minute. Uh, we got a few men here that have the gift of preaching. Brother Chad, Brother Luke, right? I mean, you guys could tear it up when you're preaching. I mean, you study the Word. and uh, I'm, praising, I'm praising the Lord, not you, right? I appreciate your humility. But, but do you understand all mysteries? No. No, neither do I. Neither did Paul. He's, again, he's saying, this I can do. And this is impossible. Even if I could do the impossible, if I did it without love, it's pointless. It's meaningless. And he's trying to show them that they're showing off, but their heart wasn't right because they weren't doing it motivated by pure godly love. He says in verse 2, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith that I could move mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. He's got all knowledge. Even Google doesn't even have all knowledge, right? Verse 3, And I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. This is a man that probably did that. He probably got rid of his stuff. And though I give my body to be burned and have, have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Okay, guys, it is impossible for you to give your body to be burned with charity and still be alive and talking about it. Right? If we started bragging about our good works, man, I fed a guy the other day, and I, well, yeah, I fed two of them. Man, I gave him a box full of stuff. Man, I burned my body just to love them. And it's like, you burned your body. All right, now you're exaggerating. You can't do that. It's impossible. He's trying to give you this spectrum, and he goes to the impossibility, and he says, even if you did the greatest possible thing, which is impossible, but you did it without love, then you might as well not have even done it. So even if you do what you can do and have been doing, but you do it without love, it was pointless, hollow, empty, full of pride. He's trying to help them understand that they need to have pure motivation, the pure motivation of godly love by serving God through serving others. That's our job here, is to serve one another on God's behalf. Verse 4, charity suffereth long. Now he's going to tell us what it looks like. Suffering. God is long-suffering. That means he puts up with your stuff for a long time. More than I would. More than you would. He's better than us in that regard. Charity suffereth long and is kind. You know, when, he says, when it says charity is kind, charity is always kind. It's not seasonally kind. Or kind when it's profitable or convenient. Charity is always kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. We don't get envious at other people's wins. 
In fact, if we love them, we celebrate with them. We're happy for them. We're, we're thankful that God is blessing them. Verse 5, doth not behave itself unseemly. Boy, that's an important one, you know, because if you ever find yourself doing something that you regret later, and as, as the Lord deals with you through your conscience and that still small voice, and you're kind of kicking yourself, why did I do that? That was stupid. Man, why did I do that? You were unseemly. You were not walking charitably. You were not in pure godly love. You were selfish. It doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. The not easily provoked is, you know, well, they offended me. But you know what? I'm going to let it go. I'm going to love them anyway. I'm going to pray for them. Obviously, there's something going on that I don't know about. Thinketh no evil. That's an easy one. Boy, I have a lot of theories. Some of them are conspiracy theories, okay? <laughs> Some of them are conspiracy realities, right? But thinketh no evil is like, wait a minute. Why is he looking at me that way? I know what it is. He's mad at me about that thing from back in the day. You know, what I mean? like we, when your brain starts going off on its own thing, that's not a charity. That's not the Holy Spirit. That's your flesh. He says in verse 6, rejoiceth not in iniquity. This is important. Rejoiceth in the truth. Remember what we talked about this morning? Converting a sinner, one who has erred from the truth. They've gone off the path of truth. They're on the path of error or iniquity. And he says, convert them and get them back on the path. Notice here, he, he contrasts these two. We don't rejoice in iniquity. Somebody comes up and tells you that they did some sin and they're proud of it. You don't rejoice. Oh, good job. Sinning against the Lord. Way to go. No, we don't. We say, man, I don't want to hear that. That's horrible. Why would you say something like that? But we do rejoice in the truth. We do rejoice when somebody's walking in truth. Verse 7, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. I could spend a whole sermon on those four points, but I want you to make it your own. There's some things you need to bear for others. There's some uh, confidence you want to need to put in others, believing them. You need to hope in all things. Sometimes you need to endure in all things and just be patient for charity's sake. Verse number 8, he says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Do you understand there is uh, knowledge, farming knowledge that's disappeared from 200 years ago. Our great, great, great granddaddy's new stuff that we are clueless about today. It's gone. That, na that, that knowledge has vanished. But charity will always remain. Charity can be handed down from a father to his children and that becomes who they are because that's how they see dad operating and they are a charitable person are, they have pure godly love for others charity never faileth you know in Romans 12 he says to be not overcome with evil but overcome evil with good charity never faileth charity always wins you know it's interesting that what, what the, the weirdos of the world they go against God's design for a man and a woman. They want to stand on the corner and hold a sign that says, Love wins. And what they're, the love they're talking about is the lust of the flesh. Kind of like, I love coffee because it makes me feel good. And that's the love they're talking about. And they say that love wins because I feel good about what I'm doing in the moment. But the Bible is saying that charity never faileth. I want to see a properly dressed couple on the side of the road in loving marriage with their children saying, charity wins. Because I laid down my life for my wife, and my wife lays down her life for her husband. Charity wins, not love wins. The world doesn't know true love. They don't know selfless love. They only know what makes them feel good. That's lust. Verse 9, he says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. He's saying you don't have it all figured out yet. We don't. Even to this day, you don't have it all figured out. None of us do. But I tell you, if we love each other as Christ, as He loved us, if we'll love them the same way, then we'll be successful. He says, we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. What's he talking about? We have a little bit of charity, and he wants you to have more. You have a little bit of love, he wants you to have perfect love. That which is perfect has come in. When that pure godly love comes into your heart and you know how to use it, 
Now you've grown up unto perfection. He says in 11, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. If I may insert in the scriptures, I loved as a child. You ask my daughters, they love their chickens. But they need to learn to show charity to their siblings. And charity to their parents. And charity to the Lord. That's true love. That's the love we have to grow up to, right? When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Brother Ross and I were just talking about this. Uh, notice there's no room in this verse for adolescence, that rebellious phase of, I'm going to sow my wild oats for a season or two or ten, and I might come back, maybe. Uh, we don't see that in the Bible. Hey, you don't see that in that old farming culture either. It's like we're training you, you're learning, you're obeying, you're old enough to take care of this and now that, and oh, hey, you're eight years old, you're a man now, get out there and plow the field. I mean, we don't have it as hard as we used to today. But he's trying to tell us spiritual gifts. We go from being a child kind of without any real gifts and limited in our understanding and knowledge and love. But then one day it's just like you jump up to adulthood. And too many adults choose to sit back down and pretend like they're a child. And they love video games and they love sports and they love everything except the Word of God and except their brothers and sisters in Christ. We should not allow our children to say, well, you know, they'll have a season of rebellion and hopefully they come back. What was the statement that whatever you do as a teenager is probably what you'll do the majority of your life for the rest of your life. I, 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 that thought was introduced to me, that concept, and I said, hmm, let me think of some people I know. Ooh, boy, they're still living just like they were when they were 18 with their buddies. They're grown men, living like children, acting like children, forsaking grown-up stuff, right? Look, he says in verse 12, for now we see through a glass darkly. All right, looking through a dark glass, it's opaque it's mysterious it's hard to understand it all but then face to face now I know in part but then I shall know even as I am known I think when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ we will see ourselves our true selves in a mirror and we'll be humbled and afraid and ashamed and he's still gonna love us but I think we're going to see what we've been missing out on. Right now, we love in part. We love very little. But if we would love as Christ, then we would see our selfishness now. We would look in that mirror and say, Lord, show me my secret faults so I'm not full of pride and puffed up and thinking evil and preferring myself above others. Lord, teach me how to have charity. Verse 13, And now abideth faith, Hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Why is the greatest charity? I mean, the word faith surely has to be used in the Bible more than charity. I mean, we're saved by faith. It's by trusting in the Lord. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Surely that word is more important. In Jude one twenty two, what's he say? Of some have compassion, making a difference. Others save with fear. Some people need to see that you love them and you have compassion on them. You have the charity that Christ would have on them and it'll change their world. It will give them hope. It will give them faith. I almost think that he's saying here, if you'll let God's love work through you and have the works of love, that's called charity, pure, godly love, then you can actually help people get past their problems and their stumbling blocks with the gospel, and they can have faith, and they can have hope in Christ when they see charity in you. I think a lack of charity is the largest stumbling block to preaching the gospel. Uh, there's some guys, I went out soul winning with two guys one time, and these are two of the angriest guys I've ever met in my life, even to this day. Interestingly enough, one called me about two months ago and just apologized, and it was really neat, and I just, I forgave him, no questions asked, and I just, I love you, brother. But I was with these two guys one day, and we're out soul winning, and 
we hit some interesting characters that day. One guy slammed the door. I believe in science, you know. And it's like, well, I do too, you know. I mean, I don't know what it was. It was like that contentious spirit was just rolling down the block, and it was just really interesting observation. But no, no joke. They, of course, we end up getting in an argument, a spiritual argument with somebody over doctrine at the door, and it just took me back to years ago when I was going soul winning on my own when I didn't have a good faithful church where, where the church it says they're supposed to send us out soul winning and. I was doing it out of order. I thought, hey, I can do it. But I would end up arguing with people about their doctrine. And when I saw these two guys, which were hard-headed, like ex-Marines, both of them, and they're just wanting to argue with people, I'd say, you know, where's the love? And I'm not some free love hippie. Y'all know that. But, but what I'm saying is, when you knock on somebody's door, if they're different than you, they don't have the right answer, can you show them some compassion? Have enough charity to give them a good, perfect, pure gospel presentation, to give them enough of a chance, even if they frown at you and yell at you, man, you just smile and go about it because no man can take your joy. They can't take what you have. You have the opportunity to plant a seed of love in their house, like you're throwing a hand grenade in the door before they slam it. Go away, I don't want any. Hey, God bless you anyway, okay? If there's anything the church can do for you, you just give us a call. Can we pray for you for anything? Is everything okay? That's the kind of thing that drops somebody's guard. Hey, is God with you? Well, yeah, He's always with me. Then what are you worried about? I just want to compel you. Now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love, one toward another, so much the more in the house of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, and I thank you for loving us. Lord, I pray that you would use us to love each other more. And I just ask that you would get all the glory in this church and all that we do. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to take the love that you've given us and take it outside of these walls and share it with people that don't have a good church, that need to be connected with people that love on them and pray for them, Lord, I do pray that charity would be a word that would describe just how we interact with each other here. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.